Oh, good evening, all. Uh, I had the great pleasure of seeing your station um, uh, earlier this afternoon, and uh, it was something to behold. You obviously have a very, very well-run, uh, very, very exciting club here. Um, so I, you know, I applaud your your efforts to, to build that wonderful station and to, uh, you know, generate the energy that I'm sensing in the room here tonight. I also want to thank the club for a wonderful dinner I had. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to spend. Uh, the next 45 minutes or so going through some information about uh, some propagation tools uh, that I've used over the years for um, uh, maximizing my contest scores as well as uh, working some uh, interesting DX. Uh, charts will take maybe about 45 minutes or so to go through. So uh, please, along the way, uh, uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'd be happy to take them as we go through this. So let me tell you a little bit more about me. Um, I was first licensed uh, in, uh, uh, on field day morning, interestingly enough, in uh, June of 1970. And my initial call sign was WN3OVZ. Uh, I got my current call sign, A3B, in 1978, right after the FCC authorized two by ones for the first time. And uh, that was a pretty exciting period because nobody knew what a two by one was. So I got on the air and uh, created pileups. And uh, that, that led to some exciting times. Uh, I've operated, in addition to uh, operating from here, I've, I've operated uh, from various places through the world, um, a number of places in the Caribbean, inclu including uh, Anguilla, Turks and Caicos, and Antigua. And I'm still very active in Antigua, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, on, on some subsequent slides. Um, I love CW. CW is my favorite mode, yeah. and, and I uh, learned that. Um, I learned that uh, th by traffic handling. For those of you that, that, that may have participated in traffic handling, uh, I did uh, a lot of traffic handling all through the, the uh, uh, 70s, 80s, and, and early 90s, and uh, really learned a lot about the art of CW as a result of that. Uh, I'm the past president of the Penn Wireless Association, which is a club based out of uh, 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 the suburbs of Philadelphia. Uh, they operate field day. You may have heard the call W3 Sky King, Whiskey 3 Sierra Kilo. They, they're very active in field day. And uh, uh, I went to field day with them for many years until I moved out of that area to my current QTH. As Van mentioned, I'm a member of the Frankfurt Radio Club. As a matter of fact, I'm the treasurer of the club. I'm also a, uh, the secretary treasurer of the uh, Pennsylvania CUSO Party Association, which was a group that was formed to pick up the uh, Pennsylvania CUSO party last year after the Nittany Amateur Radio Club gave it up. I'm a member of the uh, First Class CW Operators Club, CW Ops, and, and the League. So uh, again, that's a little bit about me. Let me go walk through my uh, station. Um, I am, at to first order, a contester. So my station is configured as a contest setup. And it's in a mode that, or it's in a configuration that we refer to as single op two radio. And what that fundamentally means is that I can operate two bands simultaneously. So uh, I'll be transmitting on one band, listening on another, and, and, and rapidly flip back and forth between the two. Uh, as a result of that, that setup, what I have is uh, two main radios. The, the radio uh, uh, on the left here is an Elcraft K3S. And the radio on the right is a IC7800, ICOM7800. I also have two uh, uh, legal limit auto tune amplifiers, which are the ACOM 2000As. Uh, you can see some of the antenna switching stuff. The station is set up to automatically switch bands, but any, I have multiple antennas on every band, and I have to manually pick the antennas that I want to use on each band. That's what all this uh, switching hardware is for. Uh, this is the antenna uh, setup. <coughs> I have three towers. Uh, the tower on, on my right is the uh, um, 80 foot uh, of Rhone 45. This is a nine element tri-bander at, at 80 feet. And this is a two element 40 meter beam at 90 feet. The big tower in the back is 110 feet. There are three uh, Skyhawk tri-banders on it, one at 35 feet, one at 65 feet, one at 95 feet, and another 40 meter uh, beam at uh, 110 feet. And then the tower, uh, uh, um, uh, the small tower here, the 70-footer, it has a uh, Cushcraft A4 on the, at 70-foot and six elements at, on, uh, uh, I'm sorry, five elements on six meters at about 75 feet. You can't see it very well in the picture, but there's a bunch of wires here as well. I have uh, 
wire antennas for 160, 80. Um, and I also have back in the woods a, a, a 530 foot beverage that uh, runs northeast and southwest, and that's reversible. I can go either direction with it. So uh, I live in Boyertown, Pennsylvania, which is about 50 miles northwest of Philadelphia. It's near Reading, Pennsylvania, if, if you know where that is. And I've been out there since uh, 1987. And I build something every year. The station has been a work in progress ever since. As a matter of fact, these Skyhawks were just installed last week. Um, I also, as I mentioned, I, I, I've been going to Antigua. I, I started going to Antigua, which is a, 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 a island in the Caribbean. It's in the uh, northern uh, and eastern part of the uh, Caribbean chain. Um, I've been going there every year since 1998, and I go down there to operate the uh, CQ Worldwide uh, CW contest, and I operate in the low power category down there. Uh, you can see the picture of the setup from last year. Uh, there's two K3s there. Um, we have a very, very competitive antenna farm down there. There are six towers, and each of those, and we have stacked monoband beams on all bands between 40 and, uh, and 10. Uh, we also have an, another tower with a work antenna on it, um, so it, it's a, a very, a very potent uh, station down there. We have wire beams up for 80 meters, that, that uh, a three-element wire beam towards Europe and a three-element wire beam towards uh, uh, North America. So we're, we're, uh, we, we have put together a very uh, uh, powerful station down there. And I have uh, won the world in the low power category from that location for 15 times, including last year. And uh, I, I hold the, the world record, as, as Van said. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And it was um, this station that really uh, led to uh, my studying of the propagation tools. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that on a subsequent chart. Um, but before we start talking about propagation tools and whatnot, I figured it would be useful just to touch a little bit on the ionosphere. Now, this is a very high level view of the ionosphere. And there's a lot more science behind it. But fundamentally, the ionosphere is uh, caused by solar radiation from the sun interacting with the, the gas molecules in our atmosphere. And it creates levels of ionized particles. During the day, there are four layers uh, that result from the sun's radiation, the D level, E level, F1, and F2 layers. Now, during the day, the D level blocks signals that are below 10 megahertz. So any signal below 30 meters is blocked by the D level during the day. And that's why you don't get long haul skip on 160, 80, or 40 during the daylight hours. It's because of absorption by the D layer. Uh, also during the day, signals that are above uh, 10 megahertz pass through the D level, pass through the E level, and are reflected by either the F, or not reflected, they're refracted by either the F1 or F2 layers. And that's why you get skip on the higher frequencies during the day. Now that changes at night. At night, what happens is the D level goes away, and the F1 layer and F2 layer combine into a single F layer. And the behavior of this changes the, the, the signal propagation at night. At night, signals that are above 10 megahertz, the high frequencies, they pass right through all of this and into space. So that's why at night, typically, you don't have long call communications on the higher frequencies, because the signals are just passing uh, right through the ionosphere into space. However, signals that are below 10 megahertz are refracted by the F layer. And that's why you get skip on 40 and 80 and 160. In the evenings, it's because you are indeed getting refraction from, from the F layers. Now, another interesting layer here is the E layer. The E layer is um, difficult to model and, and forecast. But when it opens, it's a very exciting period for higher frequencies, typically 10 meters and above. And we're moving into the time of year when the E layer starts to do its thing. Okay. And you will start to hear about something called sporadic E-skip. 
And that's because this layer all of a sudden starts to refract signals. And when it does, it goes like gangbusters, OK? As a matter of fact, this morning, uh, before we came out here, I was uh, operating on six meters, and six meters was wide open. Okay? You know, it, w it was really exciting. Uh, so when it goes, it goes big. Uh, it also is very sporadic. It can be there one minute and gone the next. Signals exhibit wide swings in amplitude, um, but it's very exciting when it occurs. And again, it typically affects 10 meters, 6 meters, and 2 meters, and, and maybe even higher frequencies. Now, you can sign up for alerts for when the, uh, when the uh, e-skip occurs. And uh, if you're interested, um, you may want to get on those systems and, and take advantage of them when they occur. Now, the ionosphere, as I mentioned, is caused by solar radiation interacting with uh, the gas molecules. The level of ionization that occurs is a function of the solar radiation. So it's affected by sun angle. It's affected by time of day, by time of year. And it's also affected by an 11-year cycle of sunspots. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. The um, sunspots uh, uh, vary every day, but they do tend to follow an 11-year cycle. As many of you are aware, we're in cycle 24. We're in the, the tail end of 24 right now. Um, and that's why the conditions have not really been so hot lately. Um, the amount of ionization uh, impacts the frequencies of signals that are refracted as well as the amplitude. So that's why we study a lot about what's going on with, with the sun to try to get a sense of what it's going to mean to propagation. And indeed, the tools that I'm going to talk about on the subsequent slides, they take advantage of, uh, of uh, understanding of the 11-year cycle. They take a, a, advantage of the... Um, time of day and time of year to uh, you know, try to predict what frequencies are going to be refracted by the different layers of the ionosphere. Now, all of these tools, they uh, assume certain conditions, certain geomagnetic conditions, so certain solar conditions. And um, the problem is that the solar sun, the sun is not always cooperative. It, it, you know, it, it storms. And when it storms, it, it affects the, uh, the accuracy of these models. As a matter of fact, it significantly diminishes the accuracy of these models. So for those of you that operated ARRL sideband this year, um, you know that, um, that uh, conditions were very disturbed. And uh, that, that caused us um, you know, to, to, to really have some um, tough sledding uh, you know, throughout the contest. Now, um, the reason I got into this study of, of propagation tools was because of my activities in the Caribbean. Um, you know, I know the propagation pretty well from here on the East Coast, but the Caribbean is a different animal. It's further south, it's further east, and so you get different openings at different times. And when I go to the Caribbean, I go down there to win. I go down there to compete in a contest, and I go down there to win, okay? So what I wanted to do is I wanted to have the ability to plan in advance um, you know, where to be, what band to be on, and when. Okay? And so I started to use, I started to explore tools that, that would enable me to do that. The first tools that I used were the ARRL propagation charts. And uh, these charts used to appear mm -hmm. every month in QST. Um, you, you know, probably some of you remember that. Um, they, uh, the charts are, are, are still available. They're available on the ARRL website. If you went to the website, what you would see is there's a month-by-month -month availability of the charts, and they provide predictions for various parts of the U.S. to various parts of the world. And this is typically what they look like. This is the, uh, the data from April of, of 2019, and what you see are, um, whoops, what you see is, um, uh, you know, propagation predictions from the East Coast to 12 parts of the world. And these parts of the world tend to correspond roughly to the continents plus some other areas of interest. So let's blow up one of these, these uh, grids and, and understand how they work. So this is the grid for the path between the East Coast and Western Europe. 
So the chart is, uh, the way that it works is over here on, on this axis, there's frequency in megahertz. Over here on the right is the uh, amateur bands highlighted in thick uh, horizontal bars. And then at the bottom of the chart is the time in UTC. You can see that there are three graphs on the charts. The top graph, which is called the highest possible frequency, is the graph that shows the bands by time that are going to be open 10% of the day, or 10% of the time. So you think about that as the best case. The green chart, or the green line, corresponds to uh, uh, the, the bands that are going to be open about half the time, 50% of the time, and that's called the maximum usable frequency. And then the, uh, the um, charts at there, the uh, line at the bottom, the, the blue line, is the lowest usable frequency. And that corresponds to the, the minimum frequency on, on which a, a band will be open. And it's, it's also the, the sort of the worst case. It's at 90% of the time. So the way that these charts work is if you wanted to figure out what band to be on to work Western Europe, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to be on a band that is above the blue line. You have to be above the lowest use, usable frequency. The next thing that you want to do is you want to pick the band that's closest to but below either the green or the red line. Remembering that the green line represents about half the time the band is going to be open. And the red line represents about 10% of the time the, the band is going to be open. So typically what you do is you find the, the, the band that's above the blue line and closest to the green line. So let's take a look at some examples of that. If you want it to work um, Western Europe on 80 meters, this chart would imply that uh, about the only time you could do it is right here because this is when 80 meters is above the lowest usable frequency. And it's the only time on the chart. And that corresponds to about 0300 Zulu. And so for those of you that use 80 meters, um, you know the band is typically open at that hour to Europe. And that corresponds to, you know, at, at this time to almost the European sunrise. So uh, you know, that, that sort of is satisfying intuitively. Um, going on and looking at 40 meters, again, um, we want to be operating above the blue line. And at the uh, band that's closest to but below the green line, and that's, that's where 40 meters occur. So this, this chart suggests that 40 meters would be open to Western Europe from you know, roughly uh, uh, 000 Zulu to about uh, 0700 Zulu. Okay. Uh, similarly, on 30 meters, uh, there's two periods of time that look like it would be, would be good to Western Europe. Again, here's the, uh, the 30 meter line. This is where um, you know, the lines are, are very close. So in the time frame about 08, 0900 Zulu, and also about 20, 21, 2200 Zulu are the times when, the, uh, when 30 meters is predicted to be uh, uh, open. And uh, 20 meters, which is really the money band these days, um, again, the, the charts, uh, here's where the green line is. Here's where the 20 meter line is. So the best time to operate 20 is roughly between here and here which is roughly between 0900 Zulu and 2100 Zulu. So, you know, again, for those of you that operate the, the 20 meters, you know that that's a, a typically a pretty good time to, uh, uh, to be on there for Europe. Now, I've been focusing on the green line, but as I mentioned, you know, there is a chance that conditions could be good enough to uh, uh, be in that 10% case. So it's not a bad uh, strategy to, uh, you know, to listen to uh, you know, what the red line might imply. And in this case, it suggests that uh, 17 meters could be open some part of the month um, you know, in a period of time that's close to the same as the 20 meter time. And indeed, in April, there were openings on 17 meters. Not every day, but there were openings on, uh, on, on 17 meters to Europe. So um, these charts were you know, pretty good, pretty, pretty illustrative of um, you know, what, what to expect and, and, you know, when to be, um, you know, on certain bands. However, there were problems with these charts that, that I started to wrestle with. Um, the first is that this model assumes a pretty whomping signal, okay? It it's, it's assumes a, a, a 1,500-watt uh, signal. It assumes some pretty big antennas, too. Um, 
you know, these models assume that you're, you're running uh, uh, 1,500 watts into dipoles at 100 feet for uh, 80, 40, and 30, or Yagis at 100 feet for 17 and above, okay? And if you're not running those big antennas or that big signal, the accuracy of these models are diminished, okay? The other problem with this is that um, this is for the East Coast, okay? East Coast is a pretty big area. East Coast covers from, you know, Florida to, uh, to Maine, okay? And as you well imagine, there's different conditions uh, over that, that, that span of geography, okay? So there were, you know, some limitations to this model. And in my case, in terms of dealing with the Caribbean, this was the closest model that was available. The ARL did not provide charts, propagation charts for the Caribbean, so I used this. So I started to realize that you know, there, there may be some compromises in, in using uh, the, the propagation charts. So starting, I guess about, uh, I don't know, maybe 2006 or seven, I started to explore uh, another very powerful tool uh, called the Voice of America Coverage Analysis Program, or VOCAP, okay? Now this is a very well-supported uh, program uh, that's internationally used. It's free. It's available online with a very nice user interface, and it has many options. And I'm going to cover a couple of these options. And for those of you that are in the Frankfurt Radio Club, you'll see how I generate the reports that, that I send to you all. There's two options in particular I'm going to focus on. The first I'm going to talk about is the, the DX chart uh, planning option, and the second is the point-to-point -to, -point to prediction option. So let's first off start a, uh, um, uh, looking at the DX planning tool, this is a pretty neat tool, okay? What it does is uh, over here in, the, in, in this corner of the chart, what they provide is a summary of the published DX expeditions that are going on, okay? So, you know, DX expeditions, the bigger ones, they broadcast, the, you know, a lot about what they're doing. And what they do is they pick up that information and they tabulate it here. And then... In this section of the, of the page, you can go there and you can select your, you know, your antennas from a list of pull downs as well as the DX location antennas from a list of pull downs. So it gives you the ability to set the model to be more realistic in terms of the capabilities of your station. So it produces a higher fidelity um, you know, kind of a, a prediction. Uh, so the way that you, this works is you uh, enter your antenna data and then you enter in your six-digit grid square. I entered in the FN20EI, which is the grid scale, grid scale or grid location for Boyertown, Pennsylvania, where I live. You hit the run button and you get uh, these um, plots for each of the published DX locations, okay? So, um, you know, in, in this case, I blew up the ones for Reunion Island, which is an announced operation that was going on a few weeks ago, and they provide these plots. And let's look at these plots in a little bit more detail because that's really where the, 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 the powerful data is. This is a blow up of the plots that are, that are produced. And the way that they work is on, the, on this axis are, is the amateur bands, 80 through 10, on the bottom axis is time in UTC. Uh, at the very bottom of the chart is an indication of the sunrise and sunset times at your location as well as the DX location. And you can get one of these plots for both the short path and long path uh, activities. But the most important part of the chart are these colored blocks. These colored blocks represent the probability of making a contact, or making the path close. In other words, the probability of a successful contact uh, by frequency and by time. So um, the brighter the color, the higher the probability that the path will be there. Yellow, so, yellow is, is, is good. Okay. Yellow is good. Uh, the things that you want to avoid, uh, and by the way, up here on the top is the, is the, uh, is the, uh, the key to understanding the, 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 uh, the, the scale, okay? And you can see red, uh, you know, red's normally a color that is a warning color, right? But uh, this is actually a good thing, okay? 
So uh, red is the, is the best. And you can see that this is the short path capability. So, you know, again, just, I'll just pick one. If you want to work the Shetland Islands on 20 meters, you know, there's a real good opportunity to do it at 0100 Zulu. And again, they have a path, they have a chart like this for the short path and then the long path. Now, the long path to Shetland Islands is not as, pro is not as productive. You can see the colors are much duller. Uh, but there does appear to be at least an opportunity to work them long path on 20 meters at about uh, 22 or 2300 Zulu. So um, this is the way the chart works. Now this, this is a pretty neat tool. Um, I used it, uh, you know, a couple of years ago there was an, a, a big expedition down to the uh, Hurt Island. Um, Hurt Island is, is in South, South, it's in Antarctica, okay. And there's, I don't have a lot of practical experience about what the propagation is to that part of the world. Okay? So I used these tools to tell me when the bands would be open. And they were very effective and, and, and indeed helped me uh, uh, you know, pick up uh, uh, the uh, uh, Heard Island on, on, on a bunch of bands and whatnot. So it's a, it's a pretty neat tool. Um, and again, they, they go out of their way to keep it current. They refresh it as each new uh, DX expedition is, um, is uh, uh, announced.